uh, today Anthony is going to share with us what it takes to build a business, how to set up systems, how to set up processes in a way that you can even reach the level of handing it over. Anthony Natif is an oncology pharmacist uh, who received his training at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute in Seattle. He did a fellowship in HIV-associated malignancies and worked briefly at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. For now, I'll stop there and please join me. Let's put our hands together to welcome Anthony Natif. So, um, Natif, please let me call you Natif uh, for this. Tell us a bit about yourself, is Natif. You an average Ugandan like the rest of us? Over. Yeah, I, uh, beyond average, at least when you're considering height. Uh, extremely below average. Um, yeah, but um, as ordinary as they come, I grew up in Seta, Mukono. Uh, uh, my father had, uh, uh, I think, 28 kids uh, who were raised by a grandmother. Uh, she died at 100, uh, never used a walking stick in her life. I did as a uh, you know, when you grow up in a, in, a, in a large family like that and you're one of the youngest people, uh, resource distribution may not be as, uh, as uh, huge when it comes to you. Uh, so I, I learned to hustle from an early age. So, yeah. So as, as uh, among the best students in pharmacy school, but ended up uh, volunteering <laughs> with a program... Uh, at the Uganda Cancer Institute, um, then specialized in cancer treatment, uh, ended up running the cancer center as their head of finance and administration at the age of 24, uh, started their pharmacy, uh, was in the right place at the right time, uh, wrote the essential drugs list for cancer for Uganda, built up their medicine budget from, I think, 50 million shillings to maybe 7 billion shillings in less than two years. Then somehow I caught the eye of guys from Harvard, uh, Dana Faber Cancer Center, took me up for training, then the University of Washington, which was establishing some sort of uh, uh, research partnerships with the Uganda Cancer Institute. Uh, back up previously in the 70s, the Uganda Cancer Institute was the best treatment and research program in sub-Saharan Africa outside South Africa, but then it fell on bad times because of Amin and all the stuff. So they were trying to revive it and they needed to train people. Um, so I just happened to be present and uh, they got me to the United States, specialized in um, what you call uh, HIV associated malignancies, the pharmacy side. Then um, got into a public health program and at the University of Washington, uh, around that time, started Guardian Health, and the rest, as they say, is history. So from your story, you're studying pharmacy, uh, you're doing HIV malignancy is the pharmacy side. So how do you transition into business? What inspires you to start Guardian Health? Uh, <laughs> I was a businessman from the age of six. I, I, I mean, just like a lot of entrepreneurs here, really, you have no choice but to do business. Uh, you have a lot of uh, kids from university, I'm told. Hi, guys. The world is rough. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you look at uh, this economy in which we exist, you get uh, nearly 400,000 young Ugandans entering the job market every year for less than 10,000 formal sector job openings. Uh, the math doesn't work. And you know we have a conveyor belt of young people being uh, uh, one of, besides Niger, who probably are the youngest country on God's universe. Um, so we have to find a way of uh, creating opportunities ourselves, so that's why you end up, you know, you can't find a job, bills have to be paid, you have to do 
things that humans have to do, so to start a family and all that stuff, so you have to be creative. So, <laughs> from S to I'd go back home and run my father's lodge, come back with money, loan it to Namiango kids, and by senior six, I had like 13.8 million shillings. Uh, this is uh, 2002. My banker was religiously keeping that money. Uh, so after that, uh, she bought land. Uh, who, who went to UCU among you guys? Uganda Christian University? So that university, uh, when I was in high school, it was called Bishop Taka Theological College. So uh, then it rebranded and changed to Uganda Christian University. At the time, my grandmother used that money to buy like an acre and some change of land. On the, on the crappy side of the university, there's a place towards Buguju. As fortune would have it, and this entrepreneur's fortune, uh, I'm telling you this, I think entrepreneurs have a God up there who looks out for them. They just have to take a chance and eventually things work. But also I think that's how real life works. You don't win the lottery unless you buy the ticket. So anyway, she bought the land. I'm getting into my first year. Um, now I'm getting into how I started Guardian. So I'm getting into my first year of university. Uh, around that time, as fortune would have it, the university changes its gate to nearly right in front of my land. So imagine Makere changes its main gate to Katanga. So the people who have... Those slums will disappear so fast, you won't believe it. So my land was suddenly popular. Um, people would go to my father, as my father is also called Natif. And he was oblivious. The guys asking me to sell them land in Mukono, I don't have it. Uh, my grandmother was listening to him whine and whatever, and she was saying nothing. Uh, so anyway, I started in pharmacy school in second year. Uh, this is how I got into I, I thought I was going to be a professor, to be honest. I love to teach. I, I still go back to my career to... Well, I haven't done it in a while, but... I used to go back to teach. I used to use it as a talent acquisition strategy for Guardian. Uh, I told this pharmacist recently when they hosted me and they were feeling bad I hadn't taught them. Uh, but anyway, uh, in second year, we, we have a, a class called, uh, I think it's, uh, would we do a biochemistry class and an organic chemistry class. So we, Makere had that training. They changed the way they taught kids from lecturer instructing you to lecturer just guiding you on the major topics and then you do self-directed learning. So we used to have uh, uh, classes in our rooms and would have flip charts provided by the university as hosting these classes. So one time, you know, Professor Wang of Covidex yeah, so uh, that time he had just finished, well, he had long finished, but he was now moving to his master's program. He's very godly. He's a pastor. So he was looking for kids in New Age. Uh, there's a kid he was looking for to do Bible study. So New Age is a, is a hall of residence in Makere. So he bumps into me, shaggy hair. This is so neat, by the way. Uh, Tone jeans, I think I was wearing a sleeveless. Uh, I looked like a good for nothing kind of dude. So he's like, yeah, I'm looking for this kid. He, he also looked disheveled. He's tiny, even up to now with all that money. So he's still tiny. He's, if, you, if you're these guys who look at people for weight and say, this one is well off, this one is, deserves respect, you wouldn't respect him. Uh, so uh, I told him, well, I could help. So I called him to my room, 
sat him down. Remember, he had flip charts all over the wall that had uh, uh, benzene rings and all these drug molecules. So he sits down. I tell him, sit down. I had this small fridge that had leftover food. It had nothing else. So I told him, it was Bloxy. I told him, I'm going to run down to the canteen. UH has those canteens in every corner of the of the hall. It's rectangular. So every corner has a small canteen. I had a bit of money, so I ran down to buy soda. I think that time soda was 400 shillings. I don't remember. I'm old. So I come back and hand him a Coca-Cola. Then he says, oh, are you studying industrial chemistry? No, I told him, no, I'm studying pharmacy. So he goes like, Incidentally, I'm also a pharmacist, and I have this pharmacy that I've started on Gaza Road. It's struggling, and I'm now going back to my master's program in pharmacology. And, you know, as students, you need to be able to work, get hands-on, and this is something that we've carried on in Guardian, as I'll tell you later. I do hands-on work, community work, and, you know, just pass by and See if you like it and you see if you can work. So I'm like, why not? Uh, a taxi from Chebando to, from small gate of UH to Chebando was 200 shillings. I don't know how much it costs now. Uh, a Rolex was 500. Yeah, I understand your pain. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I jump in a taxi and go to Chevando. I find him there. So he goes like, well, here we are. This is Panadol, this is Amoxicillin, this is, these are drugs, guys, medicines. This is a BNF, there's this book, a British National Formulary, where they talk about medicines and how to dose them. And so I dived in, he threw me at the deep end. He said, I'll work with you for one week, then after, you're on your own. I'm like, okay. So we worked up to 9.30 from 6. He gave me 5,000 shillings. Can you imagine how much 5,000 shillings was those days? Faculty allowance for the whole year was like 360,000. The man is giving me 5,000 shillings for just showing up and being taught. So I was like, oh wow, this is nice. So I kept going, and I was a very zealous student. So before long, his clients so got so used to me, they would show up when I'm not around. They're like, we'll come back in the evening when that young man is around. And we grew his sales from 150,000 shillings to like a million shillings in two months. So he was very happy. I also learned to network with a lot of the big boys who stayed uh, on that road. Um, third year, uh, I had mastered how to run a pharmacy. So I meet uh, Grace of Vine. That man mentored me so much. I see him giving mentorship talks up to today. Uh, he gave me my proper introduction to community pharmacy. So he was buying that pharmacy along the Winton Road from an Indian guy who was moving to Canada. He needed, this guy's flight was the next day, so he needed stock tech to be done in a day. But he knew that, you know, ideally if someone is working a bit fast, they will take two days. But if you incentivize them, they will take maybe a day, a day and some change. So he asked a friend of mine called Noma, she's now a a professor, I think, in Australia. She was in a pharmacy program. She was in. She had worked with him for a while. So she asked him to. He asked her to find her to find him uh, kids who could do quick stock take. So he got me and a certain friend of mine called Hazel. So we went down, did his stock take. We didn't. She just showed up and said, "Hi, hi. I need this work done in a day." I'll pay you double, 100K. So I'm like, hmm, okay. What if we do it in half a day? He's like, I pay you 200. I'm like, okay. 
uh, he drove his green Peugeot when he looked so young and cool. At the time he had like, this was his sixth pharmacy. The time chains were unheard of. So he goes back. Um, we met him at like 7.30. By 12.30 we were done. So we called him back. And he's like, there's no way you guys have finished this. So I go, like, try us. Here is a list of things. Go and do a cross check. Quickly did a spot check, came back and said, I can't believe it. Here is your money. He gave us bonus. So I'm like, in my head, he looked so cool. He was doing cool stuff. The professor in me was like, ha, 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 I don't want to eat chalk. So <laughs> I went back home, told Patrick I'd met Grace and blah, blah, blah. I want to reach out to him and volunteer with him. So he's like, fine. Yeah, as long as, what if he gives you a job? I'm like, yeah, then I'll go work with him. I'll find you someone. Uh, which Patrick actually, Pogwang, appreciated. Um, so I called up Grace, went to his office. He had a branch at Watoto. Uh, we had a conversation and he told me, no, you go and start in Kamocha. I thought I was going to work for free because I offered to work for free in exchange for knowledge and how pharmacy works. So I went and worked at that vine below Cobill. Now it's, what is it called? Uh, Lisa, now. Uh, I met the likes of Bobby Wine. It was a cool place in their nascent stages when they drove Selikas. Uh, clients took a liking to me. I never went there a minute late. I left so late would make a lot of money. People would come into the pharmacy and were like three and they would ignore everyone else and come to my table and wait. Uh, but good thing it didn't piss off my manager. She just made her happy and she kept giving me shifts. I thought I was donating my time. At the end of the month, the man gave me a check. I think it was 500 or 600,000. Uh, again, faculty allowance was 360, guys. So then, but also he remembered the reason I'd gone there. It was to learn. So he would go to church on Sunday, then come back with his family and commit an hour. He would park in front of the pharmacy, come and sit down with me. Work be damned. For that one hour, I was sitting on the lap of a, a pharmaceutical giant. Just learning everything, soaking it up. Like, how do you stock? It's like you do this and this. Where do you make your most money? Ah, you can import these products from the UK. It lands here for one pound. The market sells it for ten. You can sell it for five. Everyone is happy. We do that in Guardian. That's why we become popular. We not change. Do we give you European products at half the price? First you think we are selling you fake stuff. Then you realize, oh, system serial number. These guys are just cheap. It's not that we are cheap. The market has set itself up like that. We just need to make sure. We, you find an Indian product, not that they are bad, selling twice as high as the European-made product in Guardian, and we are happy with that. I learned it from Grace. So then I knew that, you know, if I... He would open up about his struggles, you know, in business, even if you're in the most lucrative business, expansion is a problem, especially in a market like this that has no capital. So you're going to run into challenges of financing, which he was experiencing, but on the outside, all of us saw him as a rock star. So he, with time, he opened up and told me his challenges, and remember, I had land I didn't need. I told him, what if I bring money can we co-invest? He said, absolutely, but you have the money. I'm like, I think I can make the money. I can find the money. My grandmother is rich. My grandmother wasn't rich. She had no education. She, she was just at home raising all of us. But my grandmother knew we had land that she would sell. So she went flipped that land for like maybe 128 or 140 million. I don't remember. Put all, all the money on my bank account. I think I still have that statement. And I went to Grace and said, you know what, Grace has in my third year, second sale. I've got money. He's like, okay. 
I want to open a pharmacy in Tinder. I'm like, fine, let's go. So we put a small advert in Crocs Classified, now as becoming a business partner. A small advert in Crocs Classified. I, I don't know if the New Vision still runs that section. Looking for a pharmacy to buy in the areas of Tinder. So there's a lady, Michala Kalunji, uh, she had a pharmacy near the mosque. As you approach the junction, that, that, that center, Chiwatule, road going to Chiwatule, Chisasi, coming from Mulago and coming from Spear Motors, there's a large tree there, that pharmacy below. It's, I, th- I don't know if it's Good Life Now or whatever it's called. It's changed hands quite a bit. So it was opposite of that road. So we, we bought it, called it Guardian, but it was mine. We bought it for like, I think, 30 million. These days we buy pharmacies for 300 million, ridiculous. So we transferred it across. And that was my first foray into community pharmacy. So then towards the end of my fourth year, another person was moving to Canada. God bless Canada. Uh, (laughs) I have their flag at home. (laughs) So anyway, uh, someone was moving to Canada, Tenua. the pharmacist of his was called Peace Kavagambe, a very brilliant woman. I think she now she works with WH or something. So he had uh, his wife uh, was still here running the, the show. And the wife handed the pharmacy to a brother uh, who was a numbers guy in KPMG, you know, fancy, fancy. Knowing numbers doesn't mean you know business. I promise you that. Uh, it just makes you faster at saying one plus one is equal to two. But now we have computers that can do that. And I'm not, I'm not dissing the guy. So anyway, they were under-declaring their sales to Paul. He got fed up. There's that pharmacy used to be... Uh, you know Kabalagala very well. There's a road that comes from Chibuli, hits Muyanga Road. Down there, there's NGO Forum. There was that building in the, in the ditch. Uh, opposite, there used to be a bar called Deposh. Uh, people of nightlife in Kabalagala, you know that is the Vegas of Kampala. Used to be. Until Mosisi intervened. So anyway, the pharmacy was there. It was called Pharmacare. So this guy comes in, and I learned to negotiate at the time. Grace would say, ah, Natif, uh, they've called me that there's a pharmacy for sale in Kabalagala. I don't have liquidity. The other time you surprised me. Remember, I have a stash of now nearly 100 million because all the money he was paying me, I wasn't using much of it anyway. So... Um, I go talk to these guys, they call Tenua, he's like, yeah, my pharmacy, I want uh, 200 million shillings. I'm like, okay. I didn't flinch. I'm like, break it down. Uh, What is goodwill, what is cost of stock? Stupidly, he under-declares the value of goodwill because he, he was under the impression the pharmacy was making losses. So in pharmacy business, the, especially in town, the moment you open your doors, you hit with payables of 20, 25 million shillings a month, whether you make money or not, you'll have to pay. You understand? So if a guy comes and tells you we are making maybe 20 million now, it means you have to keep sending back 5 million just to keep afloat. And you haven't talked about supplier payments and all that stuff. So you, even if it were you, you would get fed up. So he was fed up, but he still had uh, that thing in his head. It was Ranako, we knew. We used to make this money. So he valued it at that and said, oh my goodwill. Remember he said 90 million or 60 million? I don't quite remember. I think he said 90 million. The rest is stock. I'm like, perfect. Hallelujah. I think he said, he said 60 million. Goodwill, the rest is stock. 
So that's 140 million of stock. I'm like, yes. Other people were competing for the store. Uh, my fights with Fieka go way back. They also wanted the store. So I put down 60 million. Grace is like, you're crazy. You're paying this man 60 million without checking anything. Do you have another 140? I'm like, because I don't have it. Look, I'm going to go out on a limb and say he doesn't have stock of 140 million. I've run, I've worked in pharmacies long enough. I made a very public show of asking him to send his uh, brother-in-law's KPMG colleagues to count. So they counted painstakingly. It ended up like maybe just under 40 million. Knock off a few near expiry products. We are in like 27. He starts saying, ah, you know, uh, at least you pay 150. I'm like, the ink already dried on the contract. I have bought. We're now just confirming the stock. Paid him another maybe 30 million or something and uh, Grace moved in medicine, branded it fine. Uh, within like a month or two, the pharmacy was making a hundred million in sales. In pharma business, uh, this is not proprietary information. Uh, a lot of you in the medical field, I can see you know this. If you make a hundred million in sales, you probably have margins of nearly 40%. But the problem is the costs are crazy. So you need to pile up. So anyway, we made quite a bit of money. I started leaving, uh, change cars every duration it took to import another car is how long I held a car. I, I didn't know what to do with money. Uh, time I also learned about tendering, importing stuff. Uh, as a billionaire at 24, like in cash, like you walk to a bank and you have a billion shillings. I wish I would go back to my younger days. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, time I got a daughter, beautiful little girl called Ruby. She's not so little anymore now. Um, but first, first back up um, because I was making a lot of money Grace was one of the most honest business people I've ever worked with you're young, he's running the show he could write you whatever he wanted but he, if, if it was we are we're splitting 60 million, we're splitting 60 million have your money I come from poverty my grandmother doesn't even have running water in her house. You understand? At the time, she didn't even have power. Electricity in the house. She would use candles. 6.30 p.m., time for bed, in Seta. So when this guy is writing me a check of 30 million, I didn't know how to deal. So first went, refurbished her house. After that was done, I was ready to blast. So anyway... Uh, finished pharmacy school. I didn't need a job. That's how I ended up volunteering with the Uganda Cancer Institute. So a lot of people ask me, why were you doing voluntary work? I mean, oftentimes we tell young guys, uh, go and do voluntary work. Uh, maybe you get hired. And then I can easily tell you, yeah, 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 I did it. But I would be lying. I would be hiding some of the truth. Unpaid internships are not for everyone. I had the benefit of being paid a lot of money from the game, from the moves I'd made. So anyway, I went, did their work. That's how I ended up into all these fancy universities. And then in 2012, I was at the University of Washington, uh, and Grace says, you know what, Natif, uh, since now you're back to chasing your career as a professor, let me come and buy, buy you out. I want to come and visit you in the U.S., for some strange reason, he booked a ticket to California. <laughs> I was up in Washington State. <laughs> I still have that picture uh, on my Facebook. Uh, I'll share it with you. 
So in Shoaz up, we go to the Hollywood Boulevard. There's an Indian restaurant somewhere there. We sit down. I genuinely wanted to be a professor. I felt, okay, now I've set my daughter up. I bought all this land. Uh, she's a very huge landlord. As broke, but she was a landlord. As now a student. Who could afford a few shots in fancy bars in Seattle? But as now back to the student life, chasing my dream of being as the professor. White picket fence, two kids, a dog. That was the dream. Uh, so Grace comes and says, I'm going to buy you for $100,000. I still have a notebook where we agreed. I read a notebook like this. It's weather beaten. We do the deal. He pays me 50K. Pays the rest over time. I was it in a hurry. I didn't really need money. Uh, I, had, I had money. Uh, so I come back for a break sometime in August 2012. I'd also had a stint in the UK, so I had, had taken a liking to the Guardian newspaper. This is where the name Guardian comes from. Uh, so I go to say bye to... It was an exit. So people say I've had exit. That was my first exit, as far as I know. Uh, so I sold him my interests went to say bye to the guys, shot them some money. So I was walking back down to, if you know Kabbalah Gala very well, walking back down to get a taxi next to what is now KFC Shell, the taxi stage. I was wearing torn jeans, uh, looking so American, had a mop of hair. Uh, I spoke with an accent, a bit. Not like these guys who go to China and, and then one week later they have a British accent. What happened to the accent? <laughs> I don't know. I lost it. I, I reverted back to form. So anyway, uh, I saw a building where Guardian is, Guardian Kabbalah Gala. Uh, it had space available for rent. It was huge. It was like that Guardian is and a half times this space if you've seen it and the thing with pharmacy business is and Muyenga Road is Muyenga Road and Gaba Road are the richest roads in Kampala so imagine a guy is renting out space twice this size just opposite Capital Pub when Capital Pub was still Capital Pub you guys there's a Stambik Bank ATM there. Stambik Bank, it turns out, had negotiated for the space. But they were still haggling with a man. Again, this is the lack of an entrepreneur. They were still haggling with a man over what? Uh, they had refused to move their ATM from where it, it was, still is, to some room where Guardian started. At the extreme end near the former Chinese. So... I call Grace. I like to play fair. There was no non-compete. But I saw this place. I'm like, this place is on the left side. Guys are going home. The other pharmacy was in a ditch. We were making money. I'm like, Grace, would you want to move to this place? He's like, no. Should I take it up? He's like, how are you going to run it? I'm like, I don't know, but it's a beautiful place. He's like, yeah, but you're also going back to school in two months. I'm like, yeah, I understand that, but what's the risk? Someone else is going to take it. He's like, okay, go for it. And that's on a phone call as I walk down to the stage. So he says, go for it. I turn back. Come and ask the guys who are doing final patch-up work where the landlord was. They take me to Daudi Kato. His father had been the first black uh, head of civil aviation authority as a book jailed by Amin because he apparently leaked the plans to allow the Israelis to, to rescue. Yeah, that was my landlord. Proper balls of steel. One of the people I admire the most in this world, he's still alive. So I go back there. I say, man, give me the space. He's like, ah, we also a banker. As in, would you be able to compete with a bank? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, 
Banks pay every six months. They're going to pay me four million shillings. I just want them to pay me another 600 to move their ATM from there. They are refusing. But the managers were here. They treated me like, ah. They want me to beg them. I'm like, ah. Do you know the owner of that bank? He's like, no. If you fell sick, would he come and treat you? No. I want to put a pharmacy. He's like, which one? Yeah, I, Vine. I, I piggybacked on the brand. He's like, oh, you're the Vine guys. Yeah, I've seen you there before. I didn't even think you were part of the ownership. Of course, I wasn't part of the ownership. I just had interests in two pharmacies. <laughs> but <laughs> you have to sell. Yeah? Latch on to everything. It's, it's borderline lying, but it wasn't lying. Guys, it wasn't lying. You can come in here and you want to shoot my partner and where's your partner? I will know they're in the ceiling and I'll tell you they're not here. I'm pointing at the floor. I'm not lying. You understand? It's for the Is greatest that good. English or Latin? <laughs> <laughs> English. But we're speaking Lugana and English where, you know, He's like, hey, Tony. Okay. But guy, but quit Tony. Um, if you can pay me one year, guarantee that, you know, I can kick the bank out. Just pay me 4.6 for one year. I'm like, okay. This was, I think, a Monday. I want it by Thursday. I'm like, what is your account number? He's like, hey, the uh, Stambic Bank, blah, blah, blah. This was around September. Um, had this conversation at around maybe 11, 12 p.m. To noon. I walked down, looked for the nearest Stambic, put his money. Went back and told him, Sento Zidavia Mzei, Wanji? Sento Zidavia Mzei, Wanji? Sento Zidavia Mzei, Wanji? Sento Zidavia Mzei, Wanji? He still, we drink now special every Wednesday. It's been a ritual. He still comes to my house and we drink. Uh, uh, next Wednesday we have uh, a drink up at my house. It's, it's a ritual. It's a tradition I've kept from 2012. September. I paid him. I didn't need that space. I didn't have at least enough money set aside for that. I didn't know how I was going to run that thing. I was going to school and nothing was going to change my mind. So I went and looked for a friend of mine, uh, Ahmed, who was a pharmacist. Um, he was working with an HIV treatment program. I told him, you know, I'm going to give you 50% of this company. I'm going to keep 10 and 40% is for my daughter. Oftentimes, everything I used to do back then, I think I was heavily in love with this girl. I still love her. She's my daughter. But I think those days it was an obsession. Did, did someone replace part of the percentage? Just asking. Uh, which percentage? My love for her? No, it evolves. Uh, the way you love a toddler is not the way you love a 12 year old who will stand up and say, Daddy, I don't agree. But still, it's love. So anyway, uh, I gave her 40 of the company and this guy, uh, I'm not ready to run a retail pharmacy. I'm making good money in my job, but I'll, you know, I can help you start. I'm like, sour. So we register the company. Uh, it's like, what are we going to do with all this space? Not if, what if you can't finance anymore? Basically, all these questions. He didn't know I had like a billion shillings and me and some change. I didn't want to give him that satisfaction. So, we registered the company in November 2012. I think it was November 12, 2012. Uh, we call it Guardian, from Guardian Health, because initially I thought I could start an insurance company and then have pharmacies under that, then have hospitals. I still have that dream, but it's still in limbo. So anyway, uh, I got National Drug Authority approval and went back to the US to school. 
One quarter passes, he's not starting. Second quarter starts, he's not starting. I get on a plane, I come back Feb 20, 2013. I'm like, man, what's up? He's like, ah, ah. man, I can't do this. He gave me back my shares. So, like, ah. I had to take up. Uh, I informed the school I needed to take a break. Informed me the, the communication was like quarter was starting, like what do you do? So anyway, got a few guys in there, looked for quick talent. As fortunate a kid I'd known from Namiyangu who was a, like a brother of my best best friend, Dr. Kaiga of Case. I had studied, I uh, had done a diploma in pharmacy, so I brought him in to help me. I found some lady called Rita, now she's married in the UK, to come and help me. And we started uh, in March 2012, I mean 2013. Uh, our first sales were 79,300, I remember them. Uh, went back to school, would quickly come back soon as the quarter ended. Uh, we opened our second store in Kansanga in June that year, third store in Bugolovi on Kaziwe's building, Naigaga Complex. Uh, uh, quickly we went to Bunga, turnover is like $2 million. Organic growth, no loan. Uh, around that time, something stupid happened. Finished my master's program, uh, got a decent job, head of vaccine access and delivery for some, for like six countries or something, which I didn't really do in preference for going to Kabanagala to sell via Grand Durex. Um, uh, my girlfriend dumped me, I think, because of that. I showed a lack of ambition. <laughs> She went back to the U.S. after being a year here with me, this miserable shopkeeper. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that, but I think it was something close to that. But I like like <laughs> truth, but couched in a lot of uh, layers. So anyway, around that time, National Drug Authority. Uh, because I had friends that had been with the Miyango. That's cool again. I speak about it highly. Uh, kids have each other's backs. So there was this kid. He had been my housemate, my roommate at campus. Uh, we'd been to Namiyango together. He was in NDA. NDA is our regulator. So he said, you know, next year they're going to stop licensing pharmacies in the busy places in Kampala. And major towns in Uganda, I'm like, uh-huh. And I was swimming in money. Uh, like, uh-huh. He's like, so now the best thing to do is you get lucrative locations. OCDK, keep quiet. By the time all these guys discover that uh, poop has hit the fan, you'll be uh, laughing all the way to the bank. Very good advice but very dangerous advice. So that's what almost tanked my company. Uh, remember I had, I could have been comfortable just, you know, making my quick money, maybe 200 million shillings every month of clean money and boring. I was still a young man. Now I've grown old, you guys. So... I was in my early 30s, um, just soon entering 40. So I, I blew money on getting locations. If you look at Guardian, it has the best locations of any retailer in this market. Whether you're selling pharmaceuticals, whether you're selling maize or something, go to any town. Guardian will have one of the best, if not the best locations. So that costs money. So we, it would cost like 100, 200 million, some cases 300 million to buy these stores. 
So we quickly ran out of money. We were using uh, supplier debt. And at the time, I had no board. I was the alpha and the omega now. This is a lesson to a lot of you guys who are building your companies. You need to have a board that holds you back. We entrepreneurs have this thing of, we have a gung-ho approach. We believe in our dreams so much that no logic is going to stop us getting it done. You look at this wall and you think you'll go through it. And you know what? You believe in yourself so much that somehow you'll find a way. But your board will tell you, you know what? Find a hammer. Show us the hammer you're going to use for this. It's not that we don't believe you can get through the wall, but there's a way you can get through it by causing less pain for everyone else. Because if you're going to use your head to get through that, you're going to have a concussion and you'll die. It's a logical argument. You'll not have time for that. So if I'd had a board at that time, I probably would have gone slow in the expansion. I would have known my numbers. And uh, I did not know that. So how I would get these locations, why I would set up, say, in Bunga and not Waise, was I used numbers. So I went to these telecom companies and somehow using a few friends I knew, would get data and see where they had their biggest mobile money transactions. So, you look at a town where they have the biggest mobile money transactions, you're like, okay, Waise, Bunga, Wandegea, uh, say Jinja, Mbale in this area. So then you drill deeper into the data and see, okay, what is the average uh, transaction. Then you'll see that in Boise it's 10,000, in Kabaragala it's 200k, then you're like, I'm ignoring this. So then that's how you find all those fancy locations that Guardian got. Then of course we built onto other things like, how far are you from a hospital? Do you have neighborhoods building around it? Our tagline was your neighborhood pharmacist still is. We wanted to be able to deliver a product to someone within 15 minutes of ordering. And this is what helped us in Kamanagala. When we started, we deliver Panadol at no extra cost. But we knew that a guy who was so out of touch as to order for Panadol for a thousand and expect that they're not going to pay the border border is the same guy who's going to buy multivites for his grandkids. Uh, he has black tax of like 500,000 in medicine. So we are super nice to them. I will jump on a border and deliver these medicines. Built up a partnership with my border guy who helped us get a lot of these locations. He's a shareholder in Guardian. I've left him there now. Um, and so we grew. Uh, one day I'll tell you the, the story of that border man. And it should teach you a few lessons about uh, valuing every employee in your organization. Maybe let me quickly tell it to you. Uh, maybe first two months of operations, I was back to Uganda, standing on the roadside, going to deliver a product in Muyanga. I stopped this guy. Uh, we go to a client, deliver the product. I'm running to another meeting. I go with him. Ended up using his services for six hours. So then he takes me back to Kabaragala and I'm like, how much do you want? I thought he was going to ask for 50k. He asks for 15,000 shillings. I ask him why. He's like, you know, in Uganda, okay, what do you Tony. Kati Musau. So why did you ask for my name? So Musau, uh, if I'd gone to Chitintali, where my stage is, I would have waited maybe 30 minutes between clients and the, I would take them, they give me 2,000 shillings, I blow fuel, but here, I only blew time. So if I do the math, I've made more money by charging you 15,000. I'm like, oh, nice. So I get his number, I pay him 50k anyway. Next day, he comes to the store. He says, you know what I saw yesterday? 
it looks like a lot of your clients would be able to buy the medicine if only you offered to deliver. And all these pharmacies in Kabalagala don't deliver. Why don't you start delivering? For me, this bike I have in Jibuga Chibalua, you know what that means? Like you pay 10,000 shillings at the end of the day to a Mugaga who owns the bike and then put fuel and then the rest of the money is yours. So it's like, Boba Tonski has a Goleta Mutua Lutsa Suno Mugaga. Okay? Then Jakubana no Vugai, Abe Kabaragala, Ne Wonkubira Una, I come and deliver your medicine. I'm like, Sawa. I was impressed. He's called Roger. If you ask anyone in Guardian, they know him. If Roger says you're going to get fired today, you get fired today. <laughs> I promise. Because he's so fair that when he grabs you, he's, he's telling the truth. So anyway, day two passes, we print posters and say we deliver. Clients would walk into the pharmacy and they're like, what? You guys deliver? Boom. Quickly, we started pushing product. We started pushing product. We started pushing product. And this guy would make more money than he made when he was driving Chibalua. I then later bought him a bike. We took back the Mugagas. Uh, and then he said, Tony, I see a struggling pharmacy. I think you should buy it. They open. They open at, at, at noon. They close at four. The lady goes back there. I don't know what she does. Goes back. Hmm? Yeah, I'm like, we'll go. Ah, ah, don't worry. I've already spoken to her. I don't know what I'm going I'm like, yes, of course. So we go and offer the, the lady money. She ended up wanting like 30 million. We pay. She was called Joan. She was so happy we were relieving her of this pharmacy. You know, Guardian Kansanga. Next, next to that market in Kansanga. We get that. Then later, like three or so months later, he's like, after he had acquired Bugolobi, uh, from some big boy. He comes and says, I see this building in Bunga. You know a Bunga branch? I don't know if you guys have been to Gaba Road just before Oryx, the road to to Kauku. There's a huge pharmacy there. At the time they were building that, that structure, a lady, Zainab, was in Denmark. In pharma, we, we usually, when we're getting inventory, we use... Uh, security checks, uh, so checks that are undated. Uh, if you delay to pay, uh, the market is controlled by... The farmer market on the wholesale side is largely Indian run, and they run, it's a, it's, a, it's a family, it's a community. So they compete on the surface, but on Sunday their kids are playing with each other, yeah going to the same restaurants. So you cannot say I'm screwing over this. Oh, forgive my French. I'm, I'm screwing over this supplier. I'm moving to the other one. They will know the game you're playing. Uh, if you delay payment with this one, they'll talk about you on Sunday. And they, they'll close the supply taps at the same time. Uh, it's a cartel. So we run into those headwinds quickly run to our banker, and we can name them, I have no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, DFCU, we applied for 500 million shillings at the time, you know, our turnover was in the billions, but now we were falling on hard times. The supplier taps had dried up, the game was up, the Ferrari was getting stuck in Mavira, darkness was approaching. Uh, suppliers started banking checks without telling you, knowing that you know you're living to from day to day, grabbing you, taking you to CPS. You get a lawyer, he comes out and says, you guys, what you're doing is illegal, which frankly is illegal, but you know money can't do anything. So you get guys threatening to jail you because you can't pay nine million shillings. It's... it's uh, 
it's a very humbling experience that I don't want any of you to ever go through. Uh, if you can avoid it and plan better. Um, sorry. When I talk about that story, it kind of gives me PTSD. So anyway, 2016, uh, I tried to apply for 500 million. I don't know why I'm getting this echo. So the bank essentially calls me and says, yeah, you're getting your offer later on Monday. I'm like, oh, finally, we're getting some gas. This fellow is getting back to the autobahn. On Monday, we get called that, you know, yes, here are emails, they had cleared your loan, but then the head of credit took interest in your file and ran your CRB and it looks like you bounced a check. So they are pulling the loan to allow you to run this thing for another three months. You don't have three months. I was stuck. So I quickly ran to my boys in Namidiango. So loaned me money. Sam just said, okay, Tony, here's money. There was one of them. At the time, he was head of legal in parliament, Pius Virivonoha. He just called and said, you know, Tony, I know you're a hustler, a young man. You know. At the time, I'd, I'd, because of the young was thing of educating me and all that stuff, I had started a bursary scheme in the school that would pay for five kids every time. I've done it for quite a while. Now I wasn't even able to do that. That was one of the things I really wanted to do most. So it was so painful, that's one of the things that had me the most. So Pius calls me, I call him and I call him stuff and I call him and I call him. I, I had this money, I was going to finish to move my house, but come and get it. I quickly jump. He's now, I think, the deputy solicitor general, that man, God bless him. I quickly jump on the border in my shorts, go to his office at parliament, get the money. I go and do some firefighting, but it was like throwing uh, a stone in a huge pit. We needed a lot more money. We didn't know how much we needed, even the 500 million. Now, in retrospect, I'm glad DFCU didn't give us that money. We wouldn't have paid it back. Um, so my OBs um, came through. And I went and talked to this PE fund the one that we recently exited with. I'm like, remember that three million you had told me you wanted to give me? And yeah. Man, I think I need it. And now I have all these fancy locations. Uh, that can make money with just a bit of money. In Fama, the biggest impediment to growth is that territorial thing that National Drug Authority put in place. There is an, there isn't an infinite supply of lucrative locations. So it's an asset. So it's a Ferrari. And the guy comes and says, yeah, if you had done this thing last year, you would still be majority owner. But now, show us your numbers. It's a numbers game. How much do you have in EBITDA? You're losing money. I'm like, okay. Ideally, we can't invest in a business that's losing money. We've never done it. But we like you as a person. We like your story. We like what you've done. Those guys actually do very good due diligence. They go. The only thing they don't check is your renal function. I mean, this guy is giving away three million dollars without security. Right? In a market where a guy is giving you, a bank is going to give you like 500 million and ask for a million dollars in collateral. First sale value of 1.5 billion, they also do deals with the valuers. You know. And the money is being sold to you at 28%. You have to be selling cocaine to be able to pay back that money. And at our age, who has collateral of a million dollars? It's hard. 
So, I, I was very open with them. I told them, you know, I'm tanking. I need money. Like, okay, usually we take maybe a year, year and a half to do these deals. But they did mine in four months. Just some sort of record. So then they took the Ferrari. Uh, instead of, you know, and you're going to see these, these management consultants, they come up with a lot of crumb work. Uh, they, and then I'm not dissing my partners. I love them. But when you raise, I can tell you this freely, you entrepreneurs, you're going to face this. You're going to raise money. Uh, the person who's giving you money is going to invest in a fish business, is going to invest in a pharmaceutical business, is going to invest in a construction business, and all this stuff. No one knows all that intimately. Do you understand? So their knowledge of business is not uh, more developed, more sophisticated than the Excel and always in an Excel sheet. Do you understand? But then as you know, you Ugandan entrepreneurs, what makes businesses work is the soft skills. So then when you get these partners in, they're going to push theory on you because they also they need time to learn the business. So you as an entrepreneur need to understand this. And in fact, uh, guys, guys who invest need to make sure entrepreneurs have this training. That post-investment might tank your company faster than pre-investment. Because suddenly now you have a proper corporate governance structure in place. Your board can fire you. My board could have fired me from Guardian. Of course, I remain a shareholder, but, you know, you've given up everything. This was your dream. You could have stayed in the United States and made it work. But now, you, in, you dived in with both feet. So you're stuck. So you're answering to people that you genuinely know don't understand the business. But it's tempting to just dismiss them. I recently said on Twitter, no one makes money by being foolish. These people understand the dynamics of business, but they may not understand the specifics of a particular business. So for you, you expect them to know how Panadol works because that's what you studied in pharmacy school. No, to them, Panadol is just an SKU. So, and the fundamentals of the business will not change. So then we had to clash a lot. But I'm telling them, guys, let's do an, a national strategy. I know if we go to Jinja, we're going to work. Like, for sure, you can make it work in Kampala. And like, our problem in Kampala was money. We are turning it around now. Let's put money in beautifying these stores. They're like, no. Put money in stock. I'm like, no. If you put money in stock, you're not going to do what? To sell if you can't bring people in. So you have those fights. Why should we spend $20,000 just beautifying a store when we can put $20,000 in inventory somewhere? Do you understand that? It's logical. It's a logical question. So <laughs> initially for me, the, 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 the response was to be angry, to throw a tantrum. You guys just don't know what you're doing. You've got in a Ferrari, handed it and taken it to the farm. And now you're complaining, you're saying, you know, you sold us a company that doesn't work. A fraudster. Of course, in, in a bit more, in a bit less colorful language. So then you waste maybe a year or so trying to understand each other. It's, it's common. It's going to happen to you. It doesn't mean your investor is bad. So you, as an entrepreneur, have a responsibility to work with your board to bring them to your view of business. The easier thing is to throw a tantrum and walk away. Then you're throwing away the baby with the bathwater. That was the temptation initially. I felt like I have not been more depressed than I was during that time. And I've actually been clinically depressed before. It was painful. We weren't communicating. So first one year post-investment, everyone thinks we are washing money. Yeah, we have like 
a fund backing us with $3 million, but I just don't walk to the bank, write a check and get it. I have to go through my board. The numbers have to make sense. I didn't want to do that. I expected them to understand the numbers because I've said it. You understand? So I was angry for nothing. These guys were right. Of course, there are things that they don't know. But that they don't know means I haven't done a very good job of explaining to them. So anyway, with time, they brought some of their people to run the show. Of course, they don't have the experience that I have. A farmer is like, quote unquote, a cartel of sorts. You have to know someone to get something. Man, it's, it's, it's like horse trading. So anyway, after the year and a half of constant fighting, we came back to the table and said, what brought us here in the first place? We both care about the company. We don't think you're a bad person. I don't think you're bad people. We're just not communicating. Do you understand? So I had to learn a bit, a lot, a crash course in uh, corporate governance. That sometimes someone can say the earth is flat. And your response shouldn't be, look at this fool. Your response is, oh, interesting idea. But have you thought about this, this and that? Communication. The moment you make the other person look foolish, and they're the ones cutting the check, they will use that to remind you as to his boss. And for them, they have investments in like 20 companies. So if you use tanks, they will not lose much, much sleep. But for you, this is your life. You get So as an entrepreneur, it's important that you learn to work with your investors. Find what makes them happy. Find how they like to receive their communication. And then once you figure that out, you're going to grow. So after a year and a half, we figured out how to communicate, shook hands, guys, we fought quite a bit. That's in the past. Built up a bit of trust. And then we went on an expansion drive. Uh, and quickly we became the go-to pharmacy in, in a lot of communities. And we... Uh, I keep saying we are. Because now I'm just a, a consultant. Uh, we... We are on course to being uh, really the most valuable pharmacy chain in East Africa. Uh, something that we started with 50K. So last week, we, after quite a bit of due diligence, we were acquired. I'm not at liberty to tell you the figures. A lot of people call me the $20 million man. I don't understand these people. One of them saw me on a border yesterday and said, Why are you on a border? <laughs> I didn't start riding borders because I was poor. But anyway, that's besides the point. So yeah, we were acquired fairly recently. But to, in order to position ourselves for that, I had to be deliberate about building uh, a succession conveyor belt of talent. Remember when I told you about being going to Macquarie to teach? So I'd go to Macquarie right? and teach as, as teaching pharmacoeconomics. And I'd find the smartest kids and bring them into the Guardian. And they would end up working and growing. And now the kid who runs Guardian is 27. He's running a multi million dollar business. We fought with my investors initially, you know, like, you know. Uh, we need to go and find a fancy MBA, maybe from Kenya, someone with experience to, you know, steady the ship. My job as a founder and managing director, really, I'm not talented in the nitty gritties of what it takes to run a business. As you founders will soon realize, you can hire people who are better at running your business than you are. That's okay. It's a good thing. Let them run with it and you hold the vision. So I knew that early on and I prepared a lot of kids. Like if our CEO, new CEO Cedric left today, 
you have like five other kids who can step in and the company won't miss a beat. So a lot of that is what builds the, the value of your company. That, yes, there's a succession plan. Yes, you, the founder, are not some shadow all over the, the company that when you're not there, the company will collapse. That will make you... It will, it's an ego booster for you, but it's stupid. Um, I started going to the mountains frequently because, you know, I needed to think, I needed to free my mind. The problems now move from shall we survive tomorrow to how do we build value? How do you make sure this company will be around 20 years down the road? Actually, those are serious problems. I can tell you. And they will stress you. It's not a bad kind of stress. You're moving from I can't pay rent, I can't pay salary, I can't pay suppliers to how do I make sure my business partner is happy? How do I make sure this client is happy? How do I make sure my staff stay and they feel rewarded? So we, one of the stats I obsess over is that staff turnover. So if my HR comes and says, oh, we lost three staff last quarter, I really need proper explanations and I'll probably fire someone up in management. If I find out that these people left because they were treated badly. So then you as a founder, you move from the day to day because I promise you, whatever idea you're working on, there's someone who runs it better. I promise you. Live with that. So when you stabilize, move, move to a position where you can now create succession. It also allows you to grow faster. In the situation Guardian is in now, it can open twice the number of pharmacies it has and it won't miss a beat. Because of that, those are the things you sell. So people will come and say, how can someone pay you all that money for pharmacy? Why not go and just buy one by one by one and save money? Valid question, but also a very naive question. That's not how it works. Uh, because you're buying systems, you're buying uh, customer reach, you're buying all this stuff. Yeah. If I keep talking, I'll talk up to more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natif. In your story, you share about... You share about mentorship, you share about family, you share about the spirit of entrepreneurship, you share about consistency, you share about uh, breaking boundaries, asking schools to let you study half term and give you open passes. You share about failure and how you dealt with it. Um, you take us through bad deals. You take us through <laughs> you take us through uh, uncalculated risk, the expansion that wasn't thought through. You take us through egos and how your ego was humbled. Another person would have just, you know, thrown in the towel, but you went back to the, you licked your wounds and went back to the private equity firm. You take us through all these things that you've kind of walked in your business life. So I think at this point, I would like to open up to three people to ask questions. One question, not five questions in one. Eh? Let's be very clear on this. Just so you know, I have time. After here, I'm going to the Chibala, so... <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. I'll keep it brief. My question is about what to consider when getting a board to work with, because you talked about it as something very important. Yes, thank you. Huh. The lessons I've learned, for the most part, from working with a board have come from someone I fundamentally disagreed with. You know, there's that board member that you think is always against you. Truthfully, that board member now, I look back, I thought I 
hated him. I loved that man. You know, he taught me how to think about business in his own way by rejecting everything I pushed. Because he wanted a more refined uh, case, business case, in everything. So, if you're choosing a board, don't choose a bunch of your friends who think the sun rises from your backside. Get someone who can disagree with you on principle and allow them to disagree with you. Start by acknowledging that you don't know everything. Be humble. There's lots of people who know how proper businesses would run, but they've never run a business. Those also bring a certain level of talent to your board. You understand? So don't go like you. You can't even run a, a, a chapati store and you're here telling me how to run a multi-million dollar business. They understand why businesses fail. They understand why someone shouldn't run business. Take their advice. Always look for that board member that fundamentally disagrees with you and the way boards work is you get into a board meeting knowing what the decision is going to be you never go into that board meeting not knowing what the decision is going to be so you work the politics of it okay you get forces aligned don't present something to the board that you're not going to win it's a sign of weakness on your part but when you don't win take the L and learn that it's not because they don't like you. People fight ideas, they shouldn't fight people. It's a business, you're all invested in it. Now, a lot of your companies may be young. Uh, mine also started young, but had I built a habit of working with a board, I probably would have built it better. But I lived to tell the tale is extreme luck on my side. A lot of people don't survive. They've been Luzira for unpaid debt, civil prison. Imagine you have unpaid debt for like 30 suppliers. How many times are you going to go to Luzira? You understand? So it's something that you need to uh, keep at the back of your mind that have people who will disagree with you and you don't throw this thing of I'm the founder in their face. That's rubbish. Uh, so pick people that you will respect. Uh, keep your friends for bad nights. You get. Um, pick people with, from a diverse field. If you're in pharma, it's okay. Pick an engineer. That's also good. Pick a lawyer somewhere. Uh, go even you can pick a Chikubo guy. <laughs> I'm telling you, the fundamentals of business are the same. First, Roger was there to support me. You see, at the end of the day, uh, like in any leadership position, you have to know that the buck stops with me. So a president has advisors. World over, the United States president has advisors. The Ugandan president has advisors and all that stuff. Okay? But when they choose to take their country to war, who gets blamed and the war goes south? Do you remember President's, President Bush's Secretary of State? Only the political types will. Do you remember his chief of staff? But you remember that, oh, President Bush went and bombed Iraq and it was a spectacular mistake. You understand? So when, as a leader, you cannot make a decision and say, oh, no, 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 Roger, you're the one who said we go here. You understand? But he was always in my corner. These guys get you, they take you to CPS, you stay there, your lawyer comes, Roger is waiting outside. His hand bring your soda and chapati. Do you understand? So, guys are going to ride with you for as long as they know you will ride with them. If they just know you as a guy who is going to write our checks and then abuse us, doesn't know my child's birthday, doesn't know what, doesn't show up at 
when you lose a, a relative, doesn't care, doesn't greet me. You will pay the best money, but when the chips are down, they will fly away. So I've tried so much to treat my people like their family. And I am confident that the new guys who have come in, whereas they may have some degrees of separation, they have appreciated this kind of thing, and I think they are going to take, take it on. So he stuck with me. I never blamed anyone for the mistakes I made. I should... The stores we got, frankly, were not bad stores. They are all making money. We just didn't have gas. We bought a Ferrari. You're going on the autobahn, which car do you want to go with? You bought a Ferrari. I've told you, Ferrari is the best thing. So, I do not know what's in your pocket. How many people know what's in their boss's pocket? So, if their boss pulls the trigger and says, we go, we go. When you're starting a pharmacy, just better be sure you've done your projections very well. I'll be happy to show you some of this. But, oh, no, I'd be defying my non-compete. But, uh, there's projections you can build. You know that if I brand this thing very well, if I put in sufficient medicine, if I put in controls, at least for us, we knew if, like, after four months, you know if the thing is going to pay off or not. Within four months, if you got a location right, and location is the name of the game, we spent a lot of money to buy locations. I'll buy a pharmacy that has zero medicine, it is losing money. I know if I play hardball, the money is going to get out of business. But I don't want to take a chance that my competitor can come and buy him. A guy will ask for 200 million and I will pay it. You know why? Because I know that if I can make 100 million in sales from that place, I will make that back that money maybe in eight months or ten months. And you look at the trends and you know within, say, four months that this business is covering. Remember the 25M I told you? The 18-25M, that it's covering it. Then there you, you roll. And you know pharmacies never leave a place. The longer you establish a track record of, I will go to Guardian, I'll find my medicine, meaning I can pass all the pharmacies in Kampala and go to Nigeria and find them and I'll have my drug. That's all you have to do. For the people of Nigeria to leave Wandegia, to leave Ntinda, to leave all those places and trust you. So you're going to buy some medicines that you'll never sell just to build up that trust that once every four or five months someone is going to come and pick this drug from me and then they'll trust that I have everything. So as you do that and spend quite a bit of time understanding your chronic care patients, because then those form the basis of your sales, that the moment you open your doors, you're going to make that money. Someone is going to buy their hypertension medicine, come rain or shine. So you price in such a way that, you know, these guys count their pennies. You price in such a way that they will keep coming back. You understand? So then you will reach an equilibrium and then the rest of the way is uh, uh, cruising. Now you will know when to expand. If you have at least six months of burn, yes, you may have, and you don't have to have all the money there. If I have 50 million shillings in cash, I can have 200 million shillings in stock. So it's important that you have a very good relationship with your supplier. You understand? So then all you have to do is set up a nice store, set up a good reputation, and you won't need to borrow money. You just go to your supplier and use his money. Now the discipline I didn't have before I got my investors, who I up to today I thank very much. They taught me a lot of stuff. The discipline I didn't have then, now I do. But even when we have money in the bank, we don't have to use it if we don't have to. I can use someone else's money. If I know that my numbers show I sell 10 packs of Panadol every two weeks, I will go and negotiate with the supplier to pay him every 60 days. You understand? 
So every two weeks, I'm using his money, I'm building up, I'm building up, I'm building up. By the time I have to pay for the 10 packs of panadol that I've sold, I have used that money to buy me my own 10 packs from profit. You understand? So it's important that you have your numbers so that the decisions you make are informed by numbers. Even growth will be informed by numbers. And it's not you to do the numbers. There's smart kids out there who just play with this stuff. Don't think that because they can't spell Panado, they don't know what they are doing. They do. Trust them, build systems, and then grow. We had a running joke one time. Guardian had so many single mothers. But it wasn't uh, by accident. Not that we were going out looking for single mothers to hire. It just so happened that a lot of the single mothers had a lot of fight in them. They had that hustle in them. So it was tempting for you to say, oh, I'm going to put out an advert and look for single mothers. No. It just so happened that those guys who came in, the Bali Yahweh, they work religiously. They are trustworthy. They, they, at the back of their mind, they're like, if I lose this job, what will my child eat? You pay attention to the data. But our hiring, nowadays, by the time I left, I wasn't participating a lot in hiring. But you know that saying of um, birds of a feather flock together? It works in business as well. Um, I would spend time with kids and learn about their fears, uh, learn about their failures. People who are very honest about their failures oftentimes make for very good leaders. People who want to hide their failures are crap. Uh, so oftentimes I would go out with these people, have a bit of whiskey, have conversations, uh, be as free as possible. If you phone me at work, you wouldn't think I was the as boss. Well. And so people trusted me and would tell me anything. Then you find out what their fear is, their dreams. Fundamentally, we all have the same dreams as humans. And then meet them at their point of need. So then you buy loyalty by being attentive to what people are saying. And through that, they will work for you, they will look at you as a brother, they will look at you as someone who cares about them, and then they will work their tail off. They will fire their own colleagues that they think are slacking or are stealing. Do you understand? Then, once you find good talent, I like people who are a bit arrogant. By the time you find good talent, ask them to hire other people for you. It's a trick that has worked for me. People who work in Guardian are bought by people who work in Guardian. Then you have a responsibility to mentor the person who has come in. So I don't spend a lot of time on training, a lot of resources on training. My trainings are going to be initial onboarding training. Then it's on you to make sure these people know what they are doing. Then we have a metric where we're looking at break even. Even with your staff, you have to see whether you're breaking even on them. Okay? How much money are they bringing in? How many clients are they seeing? Uh, don't push them to sell only the expensive medicines because you're counting them on just the metrics of money. Uh, what business ideas are they bringing? So tabulate that somehow. You'll have a rough figure as to whether you're breaking even. Oftentimes, we shun taking on uh, inexperienced people. In Guardian, we love it. Because they are an open canvas. We can mold them into whatever we want. And once we build that company culture in them, and we get them to buy in, then we have someone who's going to work with us for 10 years. So there's this girl, Linda. She worked in the second month of us working in Guardian. 
got in there and manager Rita was behind the till. She looked around and said, you know, I came, she had a diploma in pharmacy, said, I came looking for a job. I can see that place is disorganized. This place is dusty. This pharmacy, this pharmacy needs me. You can arrange these medicines better by putting them in classes of this. I don't even understand how you don't dispense the wrong product. Look, you have an antibiotic next to a painkiller. How are you telling me? And she was roasting the manager. Who was the de facto HR manager? I was like, by the way, my name is Linda. I am here. I want a job. So I was listening. So Rita is like, she was apoplectic. I cannot hire this girl. She's like, I mean, give her a chance. Listen to her. So she gave her a chance. And at the time, we had iPads were all the rage. So we would give employee of the month an iPad. This girl got an iPad every month. For three months, we scrapped the price. <laughs> When you come to a staff meeting, you would think you're at university. Honestly, like senior management meeting, it's like a university class. So yeah, that's it's it's a culture we built, but we are very purposeful. There was there's, there's a method to that madness. Uh, once again, I'd like to request us to give a round of applause to Tony. Um, the things that stood out for me were mentorship, risk, identifying opportunity. Because you saw this room, it didn't have you didn't have a plan, but you had the vision. So I think as a, as uh, as entrepreneurs, it's very important for us to hold the vision, and then uh, it might be nice to put the ego aside uh, because. If you don't put your ego aside, it might be challenging for you to build a succession plan. And if you're building to sell, or if you plan to exit, you want to have the right structures in place, but you also want to have the right people, which uh, right people will not measure up if you don't give them a chance to. So, parting shots, Latif? Uh, thank you, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm sorry, I, when I start talking, I never stop. I blame my grandmother. Uh, bless her soul. I pretty uh, can only tell you guys that uh, it sounds cliche, but your dreams are valid. Uh, I don't know how to quit. Uh, usually, when quitting means death, uh, the only option is to stay hustling. A lot of you are going to fail. Uh, I'm sure of that. Uh, there's, I've failed many times, uh, but there's lots that was asked. I was telling someone here, and they were asking me what I remember the most from the journey of building uh, a relatively successful enterprise. I remember the painful points. I don't remember the highs. They asked me what happened when you when the ink dried on your contract. I told them nothing. I went for a run and then I went cooking with my daughter. Because that's what I wanted to do. Because you spend a lot of time uh, building these companies and thinking, you know, I'm doing it for the money, I'm doing it for the money, I'm doing it for the money. The money is going to come and you'll feel empty. So build a business that is bigger than just money. Find a cause that you like, that you're passionate about. Because, trust me, like the sun rises from the east and sets in the west, you're going to get into headwinds that will make you want to kill yourself. Make sure that the cause that's pushing you on that edge is more than just money. Because only then will you not quit. You understand? So for me, going back home and looking at the people who had become family, knowing that now we employ nearly 300 people, 
the multiplier effect when you think about it you're like okay this person has kids has black tax how many people depend on you so if you quit you're not just quitting on yourself you're quitting on like a thousand people you can get on a plane and go back to washington state and do your phd and you know sing kumbaya and chase your dream of being a professor but if that means you're quitting on a thousand people people who have laid it all on the line for you then then you're a jerk and yeah I've been accused of being a jerk sometimes but that is a step too jerkish for me so you find a cause that you believe in and are willing to take the pain for but also like I tell my friend sometimes he tells me find your extreme what that means is find something that allows you to decompress when the chips are down if it for you it's singing go shout in the wind sing dance whatever for me i found it in mountaineering i'll go and stand on the edge of a cliff and it's dangerous and i'll feel so excited i'll feel alive i need sometimes you need to be reminded that you actually human with feelings with blood with you know I'm telling you the truth. The, 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 <laughs> the mental health aspects of entrepreneurship are rarely talked about. But it's really serious. Find that person you can talk to. Find your extreme. I hope it's not alcohol. Go outdoors, run a bit. You know. find something get lost in a book you get lost in something where you, know, you don't even hear the cars passing by because you're lost in this moment so that then you get your mind off of obsessing over your business that's about to fail or is on the verge because a lot of you are going to bootstrap until you don't have to by the time you don't have to either you've got a successful business or you failed and then how do you take that failure Do you take it personally? Okay. Or do you just take the lessons? So I told that lady outside that my most memorable moments of entrepreneurship were when the chips were down. That's when I knew my social network would come through. That's when I knew who of my friends was just there because I could buy whiskey. That's when I knew who of my staff was in for the long haul. It was a time we couldn't pay salaries. It's a shame. Like for three months, we couldn't pay. But these guys are coming to work. Then I told you, we know that in a few months, we're going to raise money. So we might as well stick with you. And they stuck with me. So when they're looking for land now, during this period when we had gotten stable, like hey nechi the person that you didn't pay 3 million they're buying 50 million shillings worth of land you put 25 you understand you're not loaning them the money you're just saying thank you for not quitting you get it when they're setting up some of them I've told them previously when they're ready to go and fly on their own I'm the first person they call And then I call these Indian guys who distribute medicine down there uh, downtown harass them give them medicine if they don't pick up I'll find them and it has worked they saw this go this 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 we didn't break that story Kenyans did they saw that story before me and they flooded my inbox with 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 congratulatory messages other people will think oh These guys left me and went and did their own thing. No. If you're building a business and tell someone, you know when you're ready to leave, I will support you to leave and stand on your own two feet. Those people are going to run through a brick wall for you and ironically they will not leave until they are ready to leave. Meaning you're going to get much longer service. It's a mind also it's a mind fuck. It's 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 it's, it's it's counterintuitive so be open to people be open to helping people to not work with you 
not in a bad way, but by supporting their hustle. And then they will stick with you and build your hustle. Because they know for sure their success is intertwined with your success. And that's a cheat code that I hope you never forget. Tozimba Mutima, when someone wants to leave you, support them. Uh, thanks. You're all quiet. I will try. Whoa! Whoa! For those of us, uh, we host the Founders Lounge every end of month here. We have the Take It to Startup program. Please check our website, check our socials, and you'll be able to see what we're up to. Hope to see you again end of this month. Thank you so much, Natif. Another round of applause, and we'll bring this to a close.